Hey everyone, welcome back to the uh, Neuro Health Broadcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Ben Lagarde as we talk about the importance of consistency of care. Uh, so some key takeaways from today and why this is so important. Uh, number one is the importance of staying consistent with your care plan, uh, whether that be in the clinic that you're being seen in or outside uh, with the at-home exercises that you've been given and how patients who are more regular and consistent with their care plan tend to see faster and better long-term results. We also talk about the importance of uh, consistency of the appropriate care plan. So not only is it important to be consistent with your care plan, but it's also important to be consistent with the right care plan. If you're not seeing improvements, if what you're doing maybe isn't the best and you're kind of spinning your wheels, when is it time to then seek uh, additional help to get yourself back on track, back on the uh, most effective care plan? So this was a fantastic conversation between uh, myself and uh, Dr. Ben Lagarde. So I think a lot of you are really going to appreciate this. So after a quick announcement, uh, we'll have Dr. Ben Lagarde with Consistency of Care. Uh, I also wanted to say uh, happy holidays to everybody. Uh, happy New Year. And uh, we're looking forward to releasing a lot of great new episodes here in the New Year. So thank you so much for uh, listening so far. This podcast is brought to you by Delta Neuro Health, located in Columbus, Ohio, where non-invasive personalized care is revolutionizing the way we approach complex neurological issues with cutting edge techniques in functional neurology, functional medicine, and chiropractic care. We're leading the way in managing conditions like concussion, dizziness, brain fog, anxiety, POTS, attention, and more. To learn more, visit our website at Delta Neuro Health dot com. Welcome back to the show. Uh, today, we are joined by our guest, Dr. Ben Lagarde. Thank you for joining us today. Hey, no problem. I'm excited, Dr. Joe. Yeah, uh, we're excited to have you, especially uh, about the topic we're going to talk about, which is uh, the importance of consistency of care, which I think is going to resonate with a lot of practitioners, uh, what you have to say today, and uh, hopefully resonate with patients as well. Um so before we get too deep into that topic, can you tell us a little bit about your own uh, personal story and why you got into healthcare in the first place? Yeah, so to be honest, I kind of just fell into it. Um, I um, really liked sports growing up, and I decided I wanted to do an athletic training degree because you know what? It said athletics in the title. Um, if anybody knows um, anything about athletic training, so what an athletic trainer is, is a person that runs in the field, right? Someone gets hurt. But they're kind of like a combination between like an EMT and a PT. It's kind of a nice combo. We actually have a lot of um, coursework that overlaps with like nursing because nursing um, uh, uh, classes kind of just overlap. But started with that, um, did an internship at this place called Don Cobb Strength Conditioning in Columbus, Ohio. They worked with a lot of high level athletes. And then I ended up doing strength conditioning when I got done with school. Um, and did a seasonal uh, assistant position with the Columbus Blue Jackets, which is the NHL team in Columbus, Ohio. Um, absolutely loved it. Great, great atmosphere. Um, I got fed really well. That was the best part, maybe. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but in all, in, in all honesty, it was very good learning experience. Um, I, I got to learn some, some really cool people when I was in Columbus. Um, Anthony Donskov, Matt Donskov, um, uh, and Kevin, who was a strength coach for the Columbus Blue Jackets. And um, I saw this consistency of care pattern. But then I also saw there was like something more. We had a lot of doctors come, whether it was MDs, um, DCs, come in and work with the athletes. And I was like, oh, something more. So that's kind of what brought me into the chiropractic realm uh, was that. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Um, and then how would you describe 
consistency of care based on um, what you were seeing there and uh, what you see in practice? So um, the big thing about like when we do like just podcasts in general, we want to like educate people. So I am um, just saying, you know, I talk a lot in simplistic terms um, and because that's what I need mentally to do. Um, so I'll kind of give you back what I give uh, my patients for the consistency of care. If you were to look at the population that works on their body or takes care of their body the best, what would it be? Hopefully doctors, but <laughs> yeah, hopefully doctors, but sometimes it's the opposite and that yeah. might be a time thing sometimes, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's, it's athletes, right? If you look at mm -hmm. professional athletes, um, they get treated every single day. And it's not just like they're getting treated by the chiropractor, or just by their MD, their athletic trainer. It is everybody. It is their medical doctors, their chiropractors, their acupuncturists. Um, what else? Athletic trainers, PT, massage therapists, they do sauna, whirlpool, exercise. Mm -hmm. It stacks. And I think that's what gets lost in the shuffle is because a lot of people are like, what is the one thing I can do? And you know what? There's really not one thing. But you could pick maybe a couple of things, but mm -hmm. there's really not one. And I think mm -hmm. that's what gets lost in the shuffle. Yeah. So what, um, uh, what would you ideally like to include in that kind of stack or what, what are some things that you really feel, uh, benefit the type of care you give and, uh, aid in that, uh, that consistent, yeah. uh, care? Yeah. Uh, uh, what we talk about, um, again, with the patients and even with, with the doctors, um, we uh, that I work with is we're not magicians, right? We're not going to be able to fix everything. There's a reason why there are so many different types of specialties just in the physician world in terms of radiologists, neurologists, um, chiropractic care. Uh, you can go on and on, cardiothoracic surgeons, whatever, right? Um, but what you ideally want to do is you want to have someone on your team that um, can aid you in terms of the medical system, which I think where a physician comes in, right, is when we get past that point of, man, like I've been trying things and it's really not working. And then on top of that, um, getting to the point where those people are guiding you even when you feel better. Um, so I would say get a, a physician on your team for sure and make it a consistent thing. Um, some people it's like once a week, some people it's once a month, some people it's once every few months. It's kind of person dependent. Um, when I say person dependent, it's not uh, condition dependent. Some people have a, the same conditions, but can function off of um, seeing a clinician in a different uh, time period, right? Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing, uh, if we look at all the different types of practitioners you see, whether it's a medical doctor, a uh, doctor of chiropractic, a DO, PT, um, strength conditioning coach, um, and the list goes on and on. I don't want to short anybody, but literally anybody you can think of. It takes care of the body nutritionists. Nutritionists are huge. Just a, and nutrition obviously might be the biggest thing in, in, in the grand scheme of things. But um, if there's one person that's probably the most affordable and that you see the most consistent, it is a quality personal trainer. Because when you look at that um, aspect is when people are seeing a personal trainer, you're seeing them usually a few times a week and they can have the biggest impact on that person's life because that's what it comes down to. It's repetition and consistency, which is what this whole topic is about, the consistency aspect, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, where do you think patients might or uh, practitioners might go wrong if that consistency gets disrupted? Yeah, so, and this is, I actually learned this from you quite a bit um, when I was around you when we were in Chicago. And then just seeing it on my own when I was working with athletes and then working with the like uh, general pop, you would say general population, um, is when you work with general pop, they play this pain game. Okay, it's you're in pain, you get treated, you're out of pain. Ah, let's like, you know what, go do your thing, you're out of pain or whatever. Maybe we'll give you an exercise, go do that. Um, but the big thing that athletes do right is athletes get treated every day when they have zero pain, they have nothing. And they're still getting treated because they're trying to stay in front of it. Uh, the best way to look at it is each time you get treated, it's a step up, like you're building your body. And we know um, based off research that the healthier an athlete is going into an injury, the less severe it's going to be. And usually the recovery is actually quicker too, which is why they've done a lot of um, that research in knee recovery, actually. So if you look at pretty much any athlete who gets a knee surgery, 
they will do prehab, meaning rehab before the surgery, because they know the healthier that athlete is, the quicker and better they will recover. So I think that's what gets missed is we play the game of pain, but it's actually trying to work ahead of the pain mm -hmm. is, is, the, is the thing. Not as motivating, that's the problem, is a lot of people are motivated by, oh, I need to get things addressed when I have pain or when I have high blood pressure or cholesterol, but you don't want to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, an ounce of prevention is worth a, what, a pound of cure or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, no, no doubt. Like when you, when you wait until you have an issue, we talk about this again with our doctors and our patients all the time, you're already behind. Mm -hmm. And we, we say that not to be mean, but it's just a kind of a gut check. You have it, you, your body's behind. We're not at this like homeostatic level, um, like everyone likes to talk about kind of living at. It is you're behind and we have to play catch up, which when, in the consistency of care world, um, again, going back to athletes, I said they get treated every day with zero pain. When they have an injury, they're getting treated three, four, five, six times a day. Their whole day is almost going to be recovery because if they don't play, they don't make their money, right? So that's where it's at. Can you provide our listeners with maybe a couple examples where uh, you've personally seen this in play? Maybe you've got one patient or athlete or client who is really good about sticking to their care plan. They're really diligent, um, maybe with at-home exercises, things like that on top of what you're doing with them. And then compare that to the person who maybe comes in every other month whenever back hurts or whenever something is going wrong and now they need a quick, a quick fix, quote unquote. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the first thing that comes to mind when we talk about, um, patients like coming in to get treatment is I think patients a lot of times see the doctor as when they come in, we give them something physical, whether you're seeing a chiropractor, we do the adjustment. Um, when you see a, uh, kind of a general practicing chiropractor, or we do the, um, like auto rehab in your case. Um, or if you're going to a medical doctor, you get this pill, or I don't want to say just a pill, or you get referred, or whatever, whatever the treatment care may be, maybe they refer them to a PT. And it's not just that. Uh, it, we got to get the patient to understand they're using our like knowledge, they're using our brain when they come in. And what that does is it allows the uh, physician, which is what our main job is, is to, okay, let's say we have a plan, let's say I have a plan as a chiropractor to do this many adjustments and like three adjustments in a week's time and then um we go a week okay not much change two weeks not much change i know that i need to refer you most likely right you need something other than what i can give you maybe what i'm doing is helping but maybe we need another approach as well um if you see that person one time or maybe twice that first week and don't see them for two or three weeks from then you don't know. And that's where I hear a lot of complaints. I get people that come in and complain about the practitioners and it really makes me mad, to be honest, really runs my gears because every clinician wants you to feel better. Um, and usually it comes into play as they tried what the doctor told them, but they didn't have that consistent follow up uh, with care. And that may be the doctor's fault. Maybe do, do you tell the patient, do you need to have this follow up like um, right off the bat? Right. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you look at uh, patients cross board, and this is really cool, I didn't mention uh, this when we started, but I work for the joint. I'm a senior chiropractic physician uh, at the joint chiropractic. Um, and uh, when we we have a huge patient database, we have 900 clinics, thousands of, uh, of doctors. And the patients that are the most consistent with their care actually have the least severe flare ups because we're obviously tracking pain and, uh, and diagnosis codes and all this type of stuff. But the patients that are consistent with their care, um, that could be once a week, that could be once a month, whatever it may be, but if they get on a consistent plan, then they have less severe flare-ups and uh, less uh, like flare-ups of their issues over time, which is amazing to see, right? Yeah, and you guys probably have so much data that you can pull from in that. So you're probably one of the best people who can speak to this because you can actually see the data play out over um, you know, correlation of pain, consistency of care versus uh, inconsistency of care. And I think you were touching on a, a really interesting point earlier. 
and that uh, you know you don't want to keep somebody uh, if they're not getting better, right? Mm -hmm. Like that that's something that bothers you. So can you touch on maybe the difference of consistency of appropriate care or the right care versus consistency of maybe the wrong care? And mm -hmm. uh, I, I think that's maybe a problem in uh, a lot of healthcare spheres. Yeah, and I think that's where um, we as clinicians get scared. And I have this feeling too, like, is what I'm doing right? Like, is this treatment that I have for this person correct? And they call uh, um, like uh, practicing medicine, practicing medicine for a reason. Um, it's because we're at the end of the day, and I don't know if this is losing using this term too loosely, but we're guessing. We have this knowledge of what we've learned in school, we learn with experience with other patients, and what we've learned with our continuing education uh, stuff that we do outside of the clinic. And then we make our best guess. And it could be wrong, but the only way to know is to follow up with the patient. And maybe um, you're a very busy doctor and you only have time to see um, people once a month or once a year, whatever it may be. But there needs to be things set up in place because that's where I usually see that like kickback in terms of um, uh, people not having a good uh, response to care. People aren't mad about the care. They're just mad they didn't get better. If we guide them, in that aspect of getting them better. That's the big thing. But again, if you see them and you give them your, their plan and then you don't see them for maybe, let's say it's, I don't know, a month, but maybe their issue that they're having, whether it's like vertigo or a joint pain or I don't know, GI distress, maybe it didn't even flare up. So sometimes patients associate your treatment with the problem even because maybe they saw you before it got to its like peak of, uh, of uh, seriousness, I guess we would say. Yeah, that makes sense. And um, also thinking about keeping care consistent, um, at least the appropriate care consistent. Mm -hmm. I think it's important that we also touch on you know maybe not keeping the care static right mm -hmm. like yeah. there there's something to be said about consistency of care but then also keeping that care dynamic and novel and um, using other practitioners to uh, aid the patient's healing synergistically or, or work mm -hmm. to to improve the patient's progress synergistically with what yeah. you're doing uh, I'm really glad you brought this up and um, people probably get tired of me talking about this, but I, uh, I'm i going to go off on a very short tangent, but I'm going to draw back in, I promise. Please do. Um, so <laughs> I always, yeah, <laughs> um, I always, I, I bring up, okay, do you have, because uh, people obviously come because of the joint a lot of times for joint pain or musculoskeletal um, base pains most of the time. Um, so I ask them, do they have a bone or joint problem or muscle problem? Okay, and people will say either or. Um, and it's usually more driven to a muscle problem unless somebody has some type of disease like cancer or something like that. It's usually not primarily a bone and joint problem. Um, the reason being, and the primary is the key word, is because your bones and your joints don't move themselves. So if you have like kind of a true musculoskeletal issue, even if we take an x-ray for an issue with your joint, um, it's got to be due to the muscles pulling on them properly. Um, and then I say, if they say, oh, muscle, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're right. And then I give them that little tangent. And I say, but I, it was a trick question, not the muscle either. Can't be. Your muscle is just a stake, right? It's literally just like this structure that is acted on by the nervous system. And this is the cool part about our body. And you brought up, um, when we talk about consistency of care, it's not necessarily the same thing. Your body adapts, which is the amazing thing. And we talk about neuroplasticity a lot and um, how our body just functions in terms of adapting to stress. Uh, I actually had this discussion, which I teach a cycling class in the mornings. I had this discussion this morning with the class. Um, there, it's very common you hear about like the 10,000 step rule. You need 10,000 steps in a day. If you do that consistently, your body actually starts to get less healthy in terms of um, the benefits you were seeing before because your body's adapting to the 10,000 steps. It makes it starts doing those 10,000 steps easier. Your body becomes more efficient. So mm -hmm. you have to keep raising the bar, which is essentially, okay, you did 10,000 steps, you have two options. You can do 11,000 steps or you can go walk faster. 
but it's the same thing with treatment is you have to have this progression of care. And you see this very much in the PT world is they start out and they're literally doing bare minimum. They are doing, let's say we have a knee issue. It's just flexion extension. Okay. Passive flexion extension. Then they move on to strengthening of the area. Then they move on to a, a more full body approach, we'll do some squats. Then they move on to doing jumps, things like that. Right. So when we talk about consistency of care, it's also progression of that care as well. You need to keep challenging that person's body to make sure it is above that threshold um, of pain or symptomatology, whatever the, the symptoms they're having is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And I think you just made a lot of people uh, with Fitbits very mad, but <laughs> uh, that, that's yeah, a dude, really I try, I try to point. stir people up. That's, that's my goal. I try to stir people up. <laughs> yeah. That's funny. Uh, but I think that's a very, very good point in that you know, you can't just keep things where they are. You have to keep progressing them. You cannot keep things static, especially if that thing has stopped, has lost its effectiveness, you know, or has plateaued. Uh, so that's a really, really good point. Um, so when it comes to uh, working with other practitioners, keeping your approach to care consistent with what they're providing, how uh, how best do you work with other practitioners to make sure that the plan stays the same? You know, you don't, you might need to worry about you know, if I'm doing something, but then somebody else is doing something that directly counteracts what I'm trying to do that doesn't quite vibe for the patient long term so so how how do you how do you uh, work with that to make sure that care is uh consistent okay. uh, oh this is a this is a hardball question sorry yeah yeah well yeah, we're getting to the uh, we're getting to the uh we've seen hot ones yeah so yeah, we're getting yeah, to i that. already made people mad about their fitbits and then now, <laughs> now we're gonna do this one so i think number one is um notes documentation right there needs to be something on your notes that are indicating why you're doing something so if um someone comes in and this is uh, we'll just drop back to um low back pain that's the most common complaint in all of medicine if you go to any doctor and that's a trivia question just so everyone knows if you go to like your local um, bar on a friday night and you're doing trivia what's the most common complaint in all of medicine low back pain this is what it is no matter what doctor you go to um but anyway so let's talk about low back pain some people have um, an issue where they need more flexion as their treatment, and some people have an issue where they need more extension. Um, if I am seeing someone as the initial treating doctor, um, and I don't document what I'm doing and why I'm doing it, um, that doctor maybe do something else when they come in, just maybe they saw something different, um, or they just kind of jump to what they think they need because they didn't do the exam. Right. Um, so documentation is probably number a number one. Um, if you have a tough patient, I would really recommend reaching out to um, the other clinicians that will be treating the patient. Uh, and I'm realistic. I understand that takes time. This is where documentation comes into play. Like this is why. Okay, this the next doctor can pull the patient's note up and say, oh, this is why they're doing this, and then we go from there. But um, when we talk about this seeing different doctor thing, I really truly think it can be an advantage. Because you get another set of eyes on it, and then you also get another brain on it as well. Um, so maybe they see something you don't, or then also maybe your treatment that the initial doctor recommended um, kind of runs its course in terms of, hey, maybe help them, but there's still some humps to get over. Um, and that's kind of where that comes in, in terms of maybe seeing a different doctor. And, you know, this is the tough part, is we want to do everything we can as the patients treating clinician like we want to make all their life problems go away trust me i do i want someone to come in and i want to just kind of wave that magic wand and poof, it's all gone uh but this is where when we talk about consistency of care sometimes it's a consistency of care with multiple voices voices going on um you also brought up like if there is this kind of um contradicting care going mm -hmm. on Right. Um, and that part's tough. Uh, rarely do I see that happen, actually. Like, when I, the more I work with the clinician, I truly start to trust them. And even if I think that uh, that 
care they're doing may not be 100% correct. I know I call them or maybe I know that that clinician, because I've talked to them before and seen them treat other patients that I know, hey, maybe they have a better handle on this than I do. Um, if I see that patient again and they're telling me they're doing better, awesome. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach, right? If at the end of the day, that patient is feeling better, that is a number one. So if we're talking about, hey, should, or is your guys' care contradicting each other? If you have two doctors, the question you both ask yourself, is the patient better? If they're better, then maybe that answers our question right after that, right there. Mm -hmm. right? So right. that's my thoughts on it. Yeah. But it sounds like at the end of the day, the common denominator has got to be a uh, good communication, teamwork, and uh, yeah, just having the patient's best interest in heart um, in the, in the uh, structuring of your care plan. So fantastic. Um, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, one thing I would add on that is sometimes it's not possible to contact the other clinician or um, yeah. something comes up where like, it's just maybe the patient has something going on that they didn't tell the first doctor. Um, again, it comes down to, we take that oath as a physician to do no harm to everything. And that's obviously everyone's goal. Um, but I really can't stress the point of um, the patient getting better, like and them feeling better and them having a plan to get better in the long term. Um, and it's not a bad thing to have altering opinions, I think can be actually a very good thing. It's how everyone learns, right? If everyone just believed what we were told, let's say, I don't know, like at one point we thought the world was flat, right? Like society did. So it's actually a good thing to have those competing opinions as long as we don't create mental strife towards other practitioners. I think that's what I hate to hear is when other doctors will bring up a different doctor or they'll bring up something their personal trainer did or their, their, um, PT or their medical doctor, whatever it may be, is it's just you got to remember everyone's on the same team. And um, that as long as, like, kind of like you said, the end goal is like that patient's better and them having them on a care plan that supports them long term. Yep, exactly. Um, sometimes easier said than done, but yes. that is the goal. That is the goal. Um, so, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ben, can you tell us or tell our listeners, I guess, if you had uh, one direct piece of advice for those listening, uh, one kind of like parting piece of uh, advice for those listening on why it's important to uh, stay consistent with your care and how to advocate maybe for yourself to make sure that um, all your practitioners are on the same page and making sure that you're empowered and that your care is the best for you mm -hmm. yeah um hey, number one is just asking questions uh we run into the issue sometimes uh when people come into the joint and um there's this kind of stigma of like the uh appointments are quick and they can be if you come in and you tell us hey everything's the same what you do always helps me then we're going to get you in we see the note we do what we did with you last time and get you going but um, like you said, you have to, if you have something going on, something that's new, or maybe your care isn't helping you as much as you'd like, you got to bring it up. Okay? Like, that is a number one, is you have to bring it up to the doctor, because it's the doctor's job to also help guide you. And the keyword is guide. They're not deciding for you. You guys are working together as the patient and the doctor. It's teamwork. It's not one person doing all the work. It's teamwork. So you guys have to decide together if the care plan that you have is worth continuing or if you need to go a different route. Um, on top of that, in terms of trying to get doctors to communicate to each other potentially or um, work together, um, you can't um, make decisions for other people. So some doctors will do it. Some doctors won't. You can always ask. If you don't ask, you never get what you don't ask for. So if you'd like to have two clinicians talk or discuss something, ask them. Because um, chances are, it's maybe, let's just say 50-50 if you don't ask them. If you do ask them, at least you know the answer. If the answer is no, okay. And then you got to have that discussion. Try to have that discussion yourself or maybe try to facilitate that discussion yourself. So right. I think that's the, the biggest thing is realizing as the patient, you and the doctor are working together. It's not everything the physician says isn't gospel. 
and then um, also everything um, like you shouldn't just sit there and not like have any participation. You don't just do what the doctor says. You gotta remember it's this aspect of working together, uh, but then also having trust in what they're saying, which is just the whole another can of worms, right? It's just this a mesh of beauty, to be honest. And you have the potential to get better, and that's what everybody wants. Um, when we talk about um, meshing together of different practitioners. What I would suggest to people is that, uh, and this is my one big word of wisdom, like literally my one big thing, everything works. This is why you get online and you see like, how do I treat my neck issue that I have going on? You're gonna get online and there's gonna be a thousand different links for a thousand different things. And they all work. You just gotta pick a few, be consistent with it. If it's not working, you jump to the next thing and you have this um, clinician, if you're going to someone, that will help guide you to the next thing. So it's not, maybe it's not a thousand anymore. Maybe they break it down to five or 10, right? Mm -hmm. That's where your clinician comes into play. They're going to do their treatment. And then also maybe they break down those other things into a handful that you can try. So mm -hmm. that's how I would suggest it. Okay. Wise words. Uh, I think those are great guidelines and you know, patients don't always know that they can ask questions even, or like that they do have power in decision-making. Um, and hopefully after hearing uh, what you had to say, they're going to feel even more empowered to to do so and, uh, you know, work with the doctor rather than um, just blindly follow recommendation, um, which I think is going to lead to a better, better course of care uh, for everyone. So, um, if people listening wanted to find out more about you, uh, or get in touch with you, is there any way that they might be able to do that? Um, yeah, so they can, um, email me. So, um, my email is dr.ben.lagard at the joint.com. So it's T-H-E-J-O-I-N-T.com. Uh, if you need to hear that again, just rewind the podcast. Uh, maybe that'll give you some extra extra time if you to spend on here. Um, but anyway, so that's how you can contact me. Um, shoot me an email, and I will literally get back to you within uh, 24 hours, no problem. And if I like you a lot, I will probably just call you. So let's see what happens. Perfect. Perfect. Dr. Ben, this has been great. Uh, this was a very important episode. Uh, I appreciate you coming on and uh, talking about consistency of care um and all the facets that go into that um but yeah i really appreciate it yep no dude i think you're an, you're an awesome doctor um i've really learned a lot from you in the past and and i know i kind of continue to move forward listen to your podcast so the uh, last thing i have to say is welcome back to ohio um <laughs> yeah this is where we're at all right yeah it's good to be here right <laughs> awesome me too yep all right we'll see you soon all right yep. take care everyone <laughs>